Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 304 of Gun for Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We're brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is the gun life coach, and our guest is Stephen D. Powell. Stephen is an Air Force veteran with more than 18 years of combined military, a uh, federal military and civilian law enforcement experience. Uh, Stephen has been teaching professionally for over 25 plus years as a firearms instructor for numerous organizations and agencies. His company, Patriot Outdoors Incorporated, has been operational in the defense training industry since 2004, starting a thousand acre training facility located in eastern New Mexico. Patriot has provided critical critical and rele relevant firearms training to DOD, to DOD and SOCOM state and local law enforcement and armed citizen students. Stephen has also created a new outlet for his experience and passion by creating the Gun Life Coach, which is an educational and motivational approach to helping others in life and on the range. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Hey, good morning. How are you? Uh, super good and super awesome. excited to have you on. We are uh, both in Arizona, just on opposite kind of ends of the yep. Valley of the Sun. Uh, yeah. You know, you're on the east side of Phoenix. We're on the west side of Phoenix and excited to have you on. And my background is in psychology. My degrees are in psychology. When I So when I see the gun life coach, I'm like, yeah. oh, life coaching and guns. Yeah. This is pretty yeah. awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> I do not have a degree in psychology. So, <laughs> Well, you're a parent and yeah. you're married. Yeah. So trust me on this when I say you may not have a piece of paper, but yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, you definitely have studied psychology. Stephen, thank you for yeah. your service and Absolutely. for what you do to help the community. Oh, thanks. This is awesome. Thanks. Uh, gun owners need training. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and can certainly you talk do. to us about the importance of training, what you mean by training, because I don't think that's a universal term, right? Some people think, Correct. you know, that once a year they go out and, and empty one magazine, uh, they took training, right? Yeah. Um, right. So what do you consider training? Why are you so passionate about it? Okay, so the reason why I'm so passionate about training is because as I, first of all, I could barely hit the side of Baghdad when I went into the Air Force. I never picked up a handgun. I grew up shooting shotguns in Delaware on the East Coast, and, and um, I never really had a handgun uh, much. And so when I, when I evolved my skills, as I like to say, uh, in the Air Force, I was very privileged to have an amazing amount of training in a short amount of time studying at the FBI Academy and and doing a lot of great stuff for the Air Force um, with, without too many details. But uh, what I found later on in my law enforcement career that as stellar as I became on the range, there was an extreme deficiency from my range performance to my real world performance, my, uh, my reaction times, decision-making skills, shooting skills and such. And it really, it, it really hit home for me as well as me seeing fellow officers um, get hurt, and as you see on now, bring that up to date, the, the disparity of real world training and what happens on the range and, uh, and how these cops these days are just Monday morning quarterback to death and based mm -hmm. on split, split second decisions. And so it, it became something for me. And the word coach 
was started to resonate with me because I was just a guy on the range that shot a little better than most, but I was able to communicate with people. And they're like, pal, why don't you just become an instructor? And this is like in Ohio in the early nineties. And, and, uh, I was like, Oh, I'm an instructor. I, I, okay. Uh, I, well, just consider me a coach, you know? Well, then I got all these creds and over the years been able to teach for SIG and Texas DPS and all, all over the country and overseas. And, and, um, it is my passion. That is my passion to help other people evolve their skills and evolve themselves uh, so they can be ready. And it's not always just about a bad day. It, it's about being able to have a subconscious level of performance that that is in register in their minds and their midbrain so they can access it should they ever need to, whether they're an armed citizen, you know, a, a mom or mom or dad or, or a guy on the street. Um, over the years, I've taught thousands of shooters and I've had uh, at least 12 students, civilian students that have been engaged in, in um, personal defense scenarios where they've had to shoot back and wow. they have all been successful. They have all been, you know, ridiculed by, by uh, media or, or prosecution or defense, you know, forever, wherever they were in the, in the world. And they've all come out on top with, with nobody, with nobody hurt, but the bad guy. And um, I, that's a blessing to me. Mm. And um, I think it resonates to the, the quality of training that my staff and I have been able to provide over the years. And um, that, that's why I'm so passionate about it. And that's why it's so important. Well, you know, you hit it right on the nail when you said decision-making skills. Mm. That is something right. that I think a lot of people don't really put a lot of attention into. You know, they learn how to safely handle their gun. They learn how to shoot. But right. decision-making skills can mean you going to jail or yeah. saving your life or your loved one's life. There's so much involved in that. And you can't do that by sitting in front of a target and shoot. Mm. That's correct. That's correct. Right. And Dan, if I may, uh, there's a there's a phrase I like to use on the range. I have this fly that's bothering me. Uh, there's a phrase I like to use on the range. It says you can't be thinking about what's at the end of your hand in a three to five second uh, lethal force encounter, right. which means this. You have to be thinking about where's my kid pushing my my wife out of the way, closing a car door, getting be, getting behind an engine block pushing the shopping cart out of the way, all the skills that you did on the range with those hands are subconscious. So you can be consciously thinking about who is my threat? Where is my threat? How do I become safe? And if that is not what you're thinking about, you're extremely behind the power curve and you will end up failing to some degree. Right. And I, so that's, I, I, I was uh, armed rob once. And the first thing that came to my mind was what is behind the person I'm about to shoot right now? Mm. Am I going to, get an innocent bystander am i going to you know hurt somebody else correct and, and that is something yeah. that didn't happen because well, i was lucky it was tra it was training it was yeah thinking about the situation and yeah luckily things worked out okay but that's great we have to think that's about great. that you have to think mm -hmm. about your background uh, the back yeah. stop the uh, uh where you're at what you're doing collateral right damage now. yeah yeah right Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's good for you. That's, that's excellent. And so, but you weren't thinking about, do I have a round in the chamber? Is yeah, my safety sure. off? Is my magazine seated front sight, rear sights, level center? No, you weren't thinking about that because <laughs> that has already been done. That's already been done. You did that on the range and you had a certain level of subconscious performance and you were actively thinking about the task at hand. You know, where's my bullet going to go? Who's going to, who else might get shot? And yeah, mm. that's excellent, sir. There's Good so job. Much. There's so much to it. Absolutely. Right. So you're talking, Stephen, about um, like muscle memory, right? You've done it so many times. You've operated that tool so many times um, yes. that all the rest of those things, it's like when we're first driving a car and, you know, mm -hmm. every single action, you know, am I at 10 and two and, you know, where's mm -hmm. my blinker and, you know, all those things take so much of our immediate attention. And then after a while, we've driven enough that, you know, it just all becomes, um, you know, kind of remote control for a lot of, that's right. You know, that's um, right. You know, it's funny is you bring that car analogy up because, um, we don't realize we have muscle memory until we get into the other car. So you've yes. been driving X car for so many years and then you upgrade your car and you reach for the air conditioning and it's not here, it's down here. Or you're pushing in a clutch and there is no clutch because you switch from a standard to a, most people don't drive standards anymore, but you know what I mean, right? That's when we know when the difference is. And 
it goes back to my, I like to use the phrase correct continuous repetitions. So in the, in the idea of neuroplasticity, depending on the simplicity or the complexity of the task will determine how many thousands of correct continuous repetitions will it require for the transference of information to go from the forebrain to the midbrain. And that is where you're gonna be operating under combat stress. And that's, that's your muscle memory right there. So depending on how simple it is, whether it's shifting gears or taking a draw stroke from a third level retention holster, or how many clothes do I have? Well, I'm in, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a cold state where I've got a bunch of clothing. Well, my draw time is probably not going to be as quick as when I'm in sunny Arizona here with a t-shirt or, or just one shirt on, you know? So we have to adapt for all of that. And we have to take that into consideration when we're training and take it seriously. And Stephen, don't you even, do you talk about uh, what happens before an incident happens? I mean, you're aware of your surroundings mm. and being aware yeah. mentally of what is happening so that yes. you do have that advantage? Yes, the, um, this is something that is very relevant and people can understand this easier when, if you're to travel overseas, you're not in good old United States of America and you can't have your concealed handgun. 99.9% .9 of people are going to be traveling overseas without a handgun. So what do you have to rely on? You have to rely on everything else but the gun, mm -hmm. right? You have to rely on your, the skill set training that you have on, you know, we call it gray man tactics. We talk about threat assessment. You know, how do I minimize looking like a victim? How, what is my surrounding? What are my surroundings? Where am I going? Have I mapped out the, I mean, it sounds technical and Jason Bourne, but really, you know, I've traveled in 30 some countries over the years and I've found um, not to have a gun 99% uh, of the time. Uh, and you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to understand the environment that you're that you're going to be dropped into, you know, um, from from airport to resort or wherever you're going. So you can not look like a victim. So you can perceive. And that's why it's good for us to train with good books, good seminars, audio books or what have you to become more well-rounded because we have to train the mind. Everything else is supplemental. I'm quoting another book, I'm sure, but that is, that is very, very true. You have to do that. Boy, absolutely. And so, you know, from, from those kinds of tactics to, you know, try to avoid even the, the need for a, any kind of physical self-defense, whether it's with a firearm right. or, or some other tool. Um, right. And then do you teach anything about, you know, any of the aftermath if you do have to end up um, using? What happens after? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens after a deadly force incident? Yeah, that's, that is the, that has been the kicker um, mm -hmm. for, for most when I've had people call me up in the middle of the night saying, hey, they were just involved in a shooting. And uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to use um, uh, Heather Miles, and she, she lets me talk about her. She's one of my last students. Um, I believe it was 2014 or 15 when she was, um, had a 19 year old, six, point, six foot four, 240 pound convicted rapist break in her house at 1.30 mm. in the morning. Um, she is uh, about, she's an average, you know, five, four, um, five, four, I don't know how many, how, how much she weighs, but she's, <laughs> she's a lady. We don't of, talk about that. <laughs> she, she's a, yeah, she's a wonderful mom, a wonderful wife with two little kids and her husband was out of town and the guy rang the doorbell and then he rang it again. And she's texting her husband going, Hey, are you home? Or would you forget your keys? Like, Honey, I'm, I'm in Kansas city, you know? So, uh, he didn't break in with like the boogeyman and rah, scared. He was, Hey baby, what's going on? So she's standing there in her Victoria's secrets with a Glock. And he's wanting to have a conversation. And uh, long story short, he lunged at her after a little bit of talking and um, she, she popped him. She shot him one time and he ran away. He didn't fall down. Bang, bang, you're dead did not exist. She shot him once through the torso and he ran away straight to the hospital. And she trained, um, she trained with us for over three years um, on our facility in New Mexico there when I had it. And um, she came to, I don't remember how many classes, but she was consistent with coming and shooting with her husband and shooting on her own and shooting with other women and coming in our classes. And she said, Stephen, I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, this was about three weeks after the, the shooting. She's like, Stephen, I felt like I barely did it right enough. Like all the training that I had, all the training that I had. And it was, she was two weeks after she moved from New Mexico to Kansas. Mm -hmm. After all the training, she's like, I felt like I barely did it right enough. Oh, and wow. I said, well, why'd you only shoot him once? She's like, he ran away. I said, excellent answer. 
and the, the threat stopped and so did yes. she you know and yeah. she's very fortunate god was over her and took care of her and her husband's a cool cop now in wichita and and um she's they're just stellar people and and uh if they're if they're listening to this i hope, I hope uh, they get to but uh, they're just really great people and, and i'm very thankful that it wasn't it's not just about me i mean her husband helped her out and she's been on a, her own journey in her shooting career but I'm thankful to be a part of it and to be a, a positive part of it because she was able to put her training to use and she was successful. Right. You don't know what would happen to her and her kids. Did she face yeah. any legal issues after that? Uh, no, <laughs> it was such an open and shut case. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, she, uh, yeah, the, the news was behind it and they told her to keep her gun with her and, you know, um, they convicted him and he went to jail and he lost use of his left arm based on nerve damage, and, you know, shooting oh. of the brachial artery and everything. No, too bad. Right. Um, <laughs> but the thing was she, that dude, that victim was the boyfriend of the next door neighbor. Oh gosh. The boyfriend of the next door neighbor. And on top of that, um, they found his phone in the yard when he ran away and didn't get a warrant on it. And there was child pornography on it. So they couldn't lock him away for that. So it made Heather think, well, was he really here for my kids and not me, right. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, she had no clue neighbor. I mean, her kids were playing with the neighbor's kids, you know? Oh my so to tell you that, you know, the severity of, of some of these, these opportunistic crimes, I mean, that, that bad guy knew that, that mm -hmm. her husband was out of town, but mm -hmm. he didn't know that Heather had a Glock and she knew how to use it and God bless her for it. Right. So absolutely, because a good title for a book, Heather had a Glock, Heather had a, Glock. <laughs> <laughs> um, Heather had a know, gun. Sounds like a song. Yeah. yeah. Well, so mm. I'm part of a, a group called the DC project women for gun rights. And, mm. um, in our membership, we have women who have survival stories like that. Um, yeah. one of them is, uh, Amanda Collins that when she was in college in Nevada, she, you know, law abiding, responsibly armed citizen left her gun at home when she went to class. Mm. Well, right. bad guy waiting behind her car in a parking garage, uh, didn't leave his at home, uh, ended up, sh she survived. She is alive today, but she was brutally raped. This mm. guy went on to rape and murder, I believe two other women. And oh, so, uh, Amanda says to this day that, you know, does she know for a fact she could have done what Heather did and, and had the gun at the ready and, and, and shot yeah. her attacker and ended yeah. it, ended the threat. She doesn't know for sure, but she feels like, you know, the, the chance she was denied that chance to know if not only her attack wouldn't have then been successful, but those other two women might right. be alive today. They might be alive today. And right. so when I hear you talk about Heather and how her children would play over at the neighbor's house where this man was, you know, around all the time, uh, how many lives could he have negatively impacted had she not right. had your training, had the presence of mind to have the firearm with her and right. all of those things. I mean, there is such a, a ripple effect and a, like a, a butterfly effect with so many yep. of these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, I don't know if I made up this phrase, but, you know, I've taught a lot and I, you come up with phrases when you teach, you know, to help relate that information and make sure it's communicated effectively. And uh, the day that I, I say this, the day that I don't, the day that I say I don't need it is the day that I'm going to need it. You know, it's something like that. You know, the day that I oh. think I don't have to have it on me is the day that I might have to use it. So that's why I carry it. And I say that over and over again. And I've had other scenarios from students telling me that, you know, I was going to leave my gun in the car and I went into Walmart and I came out and a guy attacked me with, you know, came at me with a knife. And because I pulled my gun, he ran away. You know, that was in New Mexico, uh, some master sergeant uh, from the Air Force base there that trained with me. And uh, it was all on video. Like this yeah. guy just yelled at him, started running at him. And he was going, he went to pick up a garden hose at the garden center in Walmart. And because he actually put his gun in his pocket um, and had it, he, if he didn't have it, he would have been fighting for the door and that guy yeah. would have collapsed on him and it would have been a bad day. I you know, the guy with the knife yeah. got hosed, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, Are you here jokes. all week? Are you, yeah, dad <laughs> jokes for sure. Dad jokes. Oh man. Dad jokes. Yeah. That's oh awesome. my gosh. But no, yeah. that thought comes to my mind. Um, you know, often I'll, I'll think, well, I'm just running out 
And then the fact right. that I've said the word just, you know, pings my brain and it's like, yeah, just take that extra second and, you know, get the yep. firearm and uh, have it with you because what's the point of it locked in that's the right. safe, you know, that's it, right. it's not going to save you there. Um, so that's the incredible. day I need it. The day I need it is the day I won't have it. That's God, why I carry it. Amen. You know, amen. be consistent. Yeah. So you do a lot of videos. Um, uh, Instagram, I think is where we see most of them or are you on YouTube as well? Yeah, I've got a YouTube channel, the gun life coach, uh-huh. And, and on Instagram and Facebook. Sure. And so they're mm -hmm. very, um, you know, I mean, it goes along with the gun life coaches. They're very motivational in tone yeah. and in topic. And, you know, you're just kind of directly talking to, uh, the listener, the viewer, uh, mm -hmm. like we are here and just kind right. of, you know, sharing the thoughts of the day and that sort of thing. Um, but then you have somewhere you're on the range, uh, you mm -hmm. know, showing different maybe techniques and that sort of thing. So, um, what, what are maybe a couple of your absolute favorite videos or the ones that get the most attention? <laughs> So I, I love helping people be motivated in life and, and inspire others. And sometimes, you know, I, I've got nothing viral. I think I've got like 83 subscribers on, on uh, YouTube. That's not why I do it. I do no, it because there's sure. somebody there. I, I do it because I've been doing this so long and I had, and Elliot, if you're watching this, he's, he's just going to laugh, but Elliot was my marketing guy in New Mexico. He's like, Steven, you got to get, you got to get on videos. You got to get on videos. And I would not do them. I was so busy teaching, but it, I was a little intimidated at the camera and I'd have all these phrases. I'm like, man, I should have wrote that phrase down. That was a really good phrase. And I finally <laughs> started, it came up this summer. It came up like, why aren't everyone else is doing it? Yeah. Why, why don't I do it? I, yeah. I don't care if I'm popular, popular or not. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have a voice and I have experience and I have a love and a passion for this industry and for my fellow Americans to grow their skills and, and their selves. And it just kind of dawned on me to kind of put that together to help people. Hey, here I am. I, I'm here to help you. You know, whether I get big or not, that's not the, that's not the issue. The, it, the, the motive behind it all is to help relate to other people that have, I, that I've, I've dealt with my stuff and however I deal with my life and we all go through things and, and we want to grow through things. And, and that, mm. that's why I'm here just to help people grow, whether it's, like I said, if it's all in, in life or on the range. And sometimes over the years, I've blended all that, you know, I've talked about defensive handgun shooting or whatever, and it turns into a life application skill based on whatever I'm saying. And, and uh, I think, I think it's very relevant to um, our shooting community, but, but also to a lot of new shooters, you know, we've had so many, we, we, what, what was it? 40 million guns were sold in the United States in 2020. That doesn't mean we have 40 million new gun owners, but we do have billions of new gun owners. And, and if, if I may, I mean, we need to share the gospel of what they, what they really need. No, yeah. no BS down to earth, layman's terms, get it, get the proper facts out there, get them on the range and get them trained well. So yes. they can, they can further their their skill set to uh protect themselves should they need to so what would you say to the three or four new million gun owners what would the first thing you would have them do other than first thing safe storage in their house but what's their next step train the mind mm -hmm. train the mind the, the guns are easy i mean we could teach a monkey how to shoot a glock all right mm -hmm. i know i got three sons i taught them all how to shoot you know it's really easy to teach them how <laughs> to shoot <laughs> but, but, uh, sir, what you were talking about is the decision-making capabilities and knowing when not to pull the gun, knowing how to de-escalate. how, what about nonviolent dispute resolution? How right. about, you know, let, check your situation awareness. If you know that this gas station over here has been robbed three or four times a year, maybe go to another one and don't even put yourself in that situation. That's where we have to be aware. We have to be aware of the news that's happening. We had this horrible horrible situation where an officer lost his life this week and that's st that traffic stop started a mile from my house down here in mm -hmm. Chandler and uh, it made news the Chandler PD officer that was killed and mm -hmm. and you know but what does that speak to it it speaks to getting educated getting mm -hmm. educated it's not always about the gun the gun skills are perishable and the gun skills need to be consistent but more so than that I mean I'm reading I don't know I'm, I'm reading like a six or seven books right now and I'm always trying to evolve not to go on the, the bleeding edge of technology and training, but to have a very consistent approach, a very methodical, pragmatic approach to deciphering information, understanding that information from my skill set, 
and, and everyone's different. So everyone learns differently. So we, we have to train the brain. Got to train Absolutely. the brain. Right, Absolutely. Stephen, I, I'm sorry, but you know, something triggered me here. So I've, I've met people that, that buy guns and once they put that gun on their side, they feel mm. like they are the king and they have the powers. And right. you hit on it that how to avoid a conflict. When yeah. I carry when I carry a gun, which is most of the time, but when I carry a gun, I'm thinking how to avoid a conflict even more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's it's I won't you know I try to make it appear that I'm strong and ready to tackle anything because anybody that's watching me, I don't want them to think I'm weak because I'm older. Right. Don't but want to be a victim, I, right? I, I, yep. I I would try to de-escalate the situation. Mm -hmm even more carrying a gun than if I'm not carrying a gun because Absolutely. of what it's going to lead you to. And that's the thing that's hard to teach people that are new with firearms. They, some of them might think that they have this new power. Mm. Correct. And that's very scary. true. Very true. So that's very true. Do you deal with that? Absolutely. And especially in law enforcement, uh, but more so in the civilians. I mean, come on, you put a 21 year old, with a badge on his chest and a gun on his hip, or even take the badge away. I've seen it because I've hired hundreds of employees over the years. And you put a young dude uh, on the range with a gun on his hip, and there's a sense of power and authority there. But you and I both know, because I don't think we're either we're in our 20s anymore, that <laughs> you know, wisdom wisdom comes with time and mm -hmm. uh, and experience. And the decisions that I made, as a, even going back in my own law enforcement, the decisions I made in domestic abuse situations where I had to respond. I would not have made those same decisions as I, as I did in my 20s as when I was helping out and working with the sheriff's office in my 40s. Totally mm -hmm. different cop. Totally mm -hmm. different cop. The way I saw the world was completely transformed in those 20-some years. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the Lord's allowed me to, to stay on this earth a little longer. That's why. You know, and yeah. I've seen things and experienced things. And, and so, um, yeah, avoiding is, is, is paramount. And, and I, I tell people this. Just because you have a gun on your body doesn't mean you go into a scenario or, or an environment because now you have a gun because you wouldn't have gone there if you never had a gun in the first place. You would never go there if you didn't have a gun. Oh, Amen. well, now I've got a gun so I can go there. No, you don't go to the dark side of town at 1.30 in the morning to walk your dog just because you have a gun now. That's, that's oh, completely man. the opposite way of thinking. You know, right. you don't go there because you know you shouldn't go there. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I was young, we were talking off camera, I was raised with three brothers and myself and a single dad. So I was the only mm -hmm. girl. And the only wow. way that I ever really was treated differently from my brothers was basically about my curfew that, you know, mm -hmm. I used to like to go running and I waited because Arizona, Phoenix area, it's hot. Right. It's and hot. so in That's the right. summer, you got to wait until it's like you said, dark you know, yeah. uh, yeah. and, uh, and for it to even be cool enough, hundred degrees at right. night, uh, midnight yep. to go, mm -hmm. to go running. And, you know, my brothers, my older brother, my dad was, he wasn't as concerned, you know, for him, but I absolutely was not allowed. So when you say, you know, going out after dark and, and doing yeah. stuff like that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't smart. And I'm glad my dad taught me that. And he taught my brother, as well, but he, he just had a little bit more leniency than, than right. the, the girl did, but, yeah. um, but it's just being smart about things. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I appreciate so much that you're, you're helping to, to, uh, give your wisdom to the younger generation that, you know, you used to think a certain way, you know, and then through right. life, you learned things and this is how you think about them now that yeah. is so valuable and important, uh, to teach. And then when, uh, Danny was talking about, um, you know, when he has his gun, when he is carrying, which is thankfully most of the time, but now that we're having right. this conversation, it's like, why are you not always carrying? Uh, cause you're gonna, you know, the <laughs> yeah. time you don't is when you're gonna need it. Um, it's that cliche, but you know, a polite society is an armed society An armed society Absolutely. tends to be a more polite society because yeah. y you assume that everyone else has the same ability that you do. Right. So you're, you're going to be more courteous um, yeah. to, to the person next to you and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I really value that you're, you're thoughtful about that in your teaching. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, you made me, there's two things I want to, I wanted to point out. I did not answer your question about my favorite videos. So the reason why I laughed when you started to ask that question is because my favorite videos aren't the favorite videos that are popular uh, because I really like speaking about life. And, you know, we all have, we all have things that hit us, you know, uh, um, whether it's divorce or, or loss of job or, you know, relationships or money or whatever it is, you know, whatever it is. And, I, I just want to encourage people to keep going, you know, whatever that is, whether you've been diagnosed with something or, or, you know, whatever that issue may be, there mm -hmm. is always another day. There's always another option. There is always another way to think about things, you know, and see it in a better light. And uh, it's, um, I, I found that to be true in my life with things that have hit me over, you know, the last 40 some years of my life. And, uh, and it's, um, I think it's valuable to, to pass that on. And, and uh, for, we're, we're supposed to use our gifts appropriately to, to help others grow, you know, and, yeah. and um, whether it's in their faith or, or just their, their career, um, yeah. I think it's important, you know. And um, so one of my favorite videos, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really have one. There was one I did on desert navigation skills. And it has nothing to do with desert navigation skills at all. It, it's about life and my, and my walk, <laughs> my faith walk with God. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, that's one of my my favorite videos. But um, but everyone loves the gun reviews, and and I, I, that's what I do. I, I I love to shoot. I've been privileged enough to work for some great organizations and grow my skills on my own facility and and with the Air Force and and law enforcement agencies. And and um, that's uh, it is a it is truly a passion of mine. And I love being able to communicate all the finer nuances of helping get through to that shooter and watching watching their target transform, watching their persona transform. Um, I, was in, uh, I was in New Mexico teaching a, a huge ladies group and, and um, seeing timid, insecure women feel empowered and feel mm -hmm. less intimidated about the, the fear of the bang and more confident about how they can just walk in mm -hmm. life. You know, and um, I had an employee at another business that she was extremely timid, never sarcastic, very, very petite young lady that uh, was shaking and almost threw up in the class uh, based oh. on her fear of what yeah. she thought, all those myths that they think yeah. about firearms. And you know, trans, you know, uh, fast forward three months later, she's sassy, she's cocky, she's, <laughs> you know, she's got a gun. And now, no, it wasn't always about the gun. It was her overcoming something. Mm -hmm. It was her overcoming her fears. You know, it could have been a self-defense class that didn't have a gun. It, that wasn't the point. The point was mm -hmm. she overcame something. And, mm -hmm. and that, was a, that was a really cool moment to see that. And I've seen that a lot, men and women. Guys just don't want to admit it. Our egos, you know, yeah. we don't want to admit things. But uh, I've seen yeah. that as well. And, and I love doing that. I love seeing people grow like that. And uh, I, I think it's important, you know, to, to help people go, go and grow. That's Get on the awesome. range and grow in life. And, you know, just like you're working with people who are having uh, a lot of times their first day on the range or their first day ever, you know, interacting with a firearm or what it means to be a gun owner and the second amendment rights, all right. of that stuff. And so, uh, you know, I have to kind of uh, giggle a little when you were like, well, you know, I don't have that many followers and I haven't, you know, it's not like I've gone yeah. viral. Well, cause we all have our first day, right. And we yeah, all have to right. grow from, from somewhere. And that's even right. the most viral influencers in the world, uh, they had yeah. to start somewhere. And, Absolutely. You know, and so yeah. I just admire that, you know, that is a commodity in this world nowadays, you know, right. how many followers, how many likes, how many subscribers. Sure. Wait, a minute, wait a minute. I have two comments. Yes. Who cares how many people follow Stephen? <laughs> Listen to the story about the girl that saved herself from being raped. No, exactly that my point. Your, that's your 55 yeah. million viewers right there. Exactly. Yeah. You accomplished yeah. that. Exactly. You, you're yeah. done, man. You, you've done it. You've, yeah. You no. saved yeah. somebody. That, that's my yeah. point. And there are so many people out there that, you know, we get so wrapped up in this, these metrics and this kind of commodity that we're like, mm -hmm. well, you know, if we, if we don't have a gajillion followers or if we're not, uh, yeah. uh, shooting, like, um, the, the name just left me, the guy that he and his dog are always out there. It's Keanu Reeves. What's the name of those movies? Oh, um, John wick. We're not shooting like John, John wick. wick. Yeah. If I can't yeah. shoot like John wick, you know, inside the yeah. first week that I'm practicing, then, uh, you know, I guess this just isn't for me, but it's the people right. that stay consistent stay yep. in the game with whatever that's it right. is um yes. that's absolutely that is true 
how we change uh, the lives around us, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the 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 testimony that might never never really be told are are the the hundreds of phone calls and emails and, and the cops that have you know I had a cop that I was teaching um, when I was teaching in Texas and I can't remember what year this is was oh nine ten or eleven somewhere like that but ended up getting into a shooting in San Antonio and mm. and um, he was wounded but he was able to shoot back and not only that um, he was successful and uh, he called me up and said uh, dude the training the last training that I did was two weeks two weeks before. I got into my shooting and it was because of the training that I just had, just had helped me uh, be successful because he had to transition because he couldn't use his arm. Oh, he had to use, wow. had to shoot offhanded. And, um, and it's, it's stories like that. And, and then all the other stories where bullets didn't, did not go down range, but they were in these like, you know, these like and kind environments where they were able to deescalate or I say skinny pedal on the right. They really they were able to get out of there. <laughs> You know, and <laughs> we're doing our job. We're doing our job. We're protecting ourselves. It's not always about the gun. You know, did you say so, skinny pedal, pedal on, the right? on the right? Skinny pedal on the right. Yeah. It's going to get out of there. If you can get out of there, hit reverse, hit D or the R and get out of there. <laughs> that's great. All right. That's a new yeah. one for me. I may be stealing yeah. it. I'm not going to lie. Oh, please. Uh, I think I stole it. I don't know. It's, it's, I like using that. I love it. Um, so, you know, we did talk about how, you know, the, the idea of a coach came in to be, yeah. but, um, yeah. the idea of it being, you know, tying in like life coach, um, mm. is there a special story behind that or did it just kind of naturally flow? It, it just kind of naturally flowed. You know, I, I have been considered a coach, I mean, whether coaching kids in soccer or, or I call myself a coach on the range because, there's a stigmatism. It's like, okay, I'm in your instructor today. And, mm. and there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of ego on the ranges. Um, I've trained, I've trained SEAL teams. I've trained SF units. Uh, I've trained Air Force Special Operations and Marines, MARSOC guys. And there's a lot of ego on those ranges, um, not just with those, but for standard law enforcement as well. I actually find less ego with the special operations community. They're very, very willing to learn. But my point is this. So I, I, I use coach and say, hey, look, th- let's just consider this. Tiger Woods is the best golfer in the world. Let's just assume that, all right? Whether he is or not, it's irrelevant, right? But does he not have a coach? Okay, let's agree that he has a coach, right? And so I say, well, I'm your coach. You may shoot a little faster than me or a little better than me today, but I'm your coach. And I'm here to help you become a little bit better than where you were yesterday or last week on the range. And so I will be your mirror. I will be here to to examine you and, and give you, provide feedback to help you, maybe, maybe you're going to learn by volumes today, or maybe you're going to learn by inches, but you will learn something today. And what you do learn from that, I want you to take that with you to the next level for whatever that is, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, carbine shotgun or, or handgun training, or, or it's hand to hand work. So, um, I, I found that that approach in talking about coaching has, um, has dissolved a lot of ego, uh, Mm -hmm. on the range and helped create a proper, a, a better learning environment for me where people go, huh, and then they see me shoot and, you know, cause you do have to prove yourself on the range. Mm-hmm. I, I pride myself in shooting at, at a 95% level of accuracy and speed at everything I do. So if I can't, if I can't walk the walk, then I should be teaching you, you know? Wow. So I, I pride myself in shooting that. So I tell people you got to shoot flies and bad guys. And so I do that. I tell, I'll, I'll shoot flies, go to my videos. You'll see them. Um, wow. And because that's, it's just important to, to, in life, right? So here yes. our life application. It's not, it's not just about talking the talk. Can you walk the walk mm-hmm. with whatever your God-given abilities are in life? Can you do that? And then how are you helping others be successful mm-hmm. in whatever that is? Mm-hmm. So that's where the whole gun life coach thing came from. Gosh. And that's great because like a lot of people are intimidated with guns and yeah. you know, they, they bought a gun. They feel like they need one. They didn't really want to buy one, mm-hmm. but they felt they need it. And the last thing you can do is be a drill instructor. Oh gosh. No. People right. don't you want to be a coach. A right. That's correct. So yeah. I you come alongside people. people. Yeah. So what do you, what do you shoot when you train? What do you, what do you shoot? Um, I am, I have brought, well, the long, the short story uh, started with a Beretta in the air force, you know, but uh, I quickly got into Glock and I ran a Glock 17 and my Glock 17 is my go-to. Um, I have like 153,000 rounds through my Glock gen four. I that I got in 2010. I've replaced almost everything on it, you know, over the years, time and time. You, you have to, right? You got to replace springs rounds? and such. Hunt, uh, I'm thinking about 155, 154,000 rounds through that gun. So I've had to change barrels. 
Yeah. Oh, in today's point. money. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh man, in that'd today's have been a money. Fund. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Man. Um, I, I train typically with a Glock 17, but I did work for Sig Sauer uh, for a number of years and trained as an adjunct f- through the academy overseas and, and across the country. And uh, so I, I ran a Sig, obviously, when I worked for Sig. And the Sig, 320, Sig P320 is, was my go to. And they're very, very similar to me. They're very similar. They're a striker fired platform. The trigger reset, I, well, I didn't have to change any trigger on the Sig, uh, but I t- tricked out my Glock. But that's what I run. I either run Glock or Sig. Um, they're two. They're two awesome performers in the industry, and uh, I, I got nothing bad to say about either. And none of them have ever caused me any issue ever. In fact, I ran my Sig 320s about 12,000 rounds before I cleaned them, and I think I lubed it once in between, oh, like gosh. about halfway. So they, the guns run, and you, you got to find a good gun that runs. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, I'll I'll put more videos about those out there. I just recorded one this morning on on Sigs, so that's coming out uh, tomorrow, I think. So, so I've literally never heard you ask that question before. So I'm very curious. He was writing something. He asked you a question. You answered, and Dan got really excited. Well, so what's going I, on I, here, I, Dan? I kind of figured you were the bread and ninety two kind of guy. That is so weird. It's weird. Like I never, really? I never, yeah. And I guess because of all the years you've had in military training <laughs> and stuff like that, and which is a yeah. great gun. It, I mean, yeah. The thing is, what we're doing, we're talking about. He guns. just. A firearm profiled you. No, so so what I want to do say, you feel objectified, so, Stephen? I just no. have to. <laughs> so what I'm, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, you never know what kind of gun fits the right kind of person. Yeah, that's true. And so when somebody's wanting to buy a gun, yeah, don't take their. You can listen to what they have to say, yeah, but go yeah. pick out the gun you want. That that's right. Test drive. Right, yeah. Test drive it. Yeah, Absolutely. you got to test drive them. And I, I, in fact, I did a video on um, going to the gun range for the very first time because there's so many new shooters out there, right? So mm-hmm. um, I, I said, look, you just don't, don't get overwhelmed to pick out seven guns. It's right. You're not gonna have any base of reference. Just, just pick out two or three, test drive them. They're not, all of them are not gonna feel the most comfortable because you've never done it before, right? Mm-hmm. It's crawl, walk, run, crawl, walk, run yeah. attitude with everything. So mm-hmm. pick a couple and I stick with, you know, I promote the top, you know, five to 10 manufacturers and models that actually are being, you know, they, they get the, they get the piss shot out of them all the time and they still run. That's the kind of right. gun that you want. That's the kind yeah. of gun that you run, you know? Absolutely. You, yeah, and, and you shoot one and you say, man, I, I shoot really good with this gun, but you might shoot better yeah. with another one. And yeah. uh, I remember my father-in-law, he, he wanted to get into race shooting, you know, the, the mm-hmm. competitive shooting. Right. And he bought a $5,000 gun. I said, yeah. You're, you could shoot just as well with in your, your skill ability right now. You're yes. not going to shoot any better with that gun than you could a five hundred dollar Glock. Yeah, and, that's true. And I, and because and it, it, you you have to have some skill to be able to shoot that well it, to do what that gun yeah. can do. But anyway, absolutely, uh, you got to grow into it. You got to grow yeah. into it. Right. And so uh, picking the right kind of gun is super important. You got to think about how it feels when you carry it, how how you react when you shoot it, and how well yep. you can shoot the gun. And so yeah. um, just don't let any one person tell you like. I remember back in the day, oh, honey, this is the gun for you. I bought this gun for you. And that doesn't work. That doesn't go over no. very well. No. Don't no, buy my doesn't. purse. Oh, don't my buy God. my shoes. And don't buy my guns. I bought her a purse. Yeah. My brother says, you need to go buy her a purse. <laughs> and I went and I bought a purse for her. I paid like $500 for it. And she yeah. just no. absolutely flipped. No, we yeah. don't spend I that kind of money on purses. Sorry. You know, I... I that's funny. Um, in, in New Mexico, when uh, I was running my, my facility there, we'd have, you know, we're in an eastern New Mexico, West Texas kind of town, you know, and these guys would come in and they're like, I'm going to buy a little lady a gun today. I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, I just need to get her a snub nose revolver. Like, OK, let, let me stop you right there. And you're, you can do that if you want. But here's the problem. You're, give, you're picking out your little lady. This, mm-hmm. this firearm that has, now whether she chooses it or not, that's one thing, but yeah. he's choosing it, right? Like what we're talking mm-hmm. about. So he's like, oh, let me get this straight. You're going to give her the shortest sight radius gun with the, the least amount of ammo next to a Derringer, the hardest to reload with a steep learning curve on reloading. And typically it's a double action revolver. So it's got about 13 and a half pound trigger pull. So you're going to give her all that. And then she's probably going to outshoot you with it in time, but there may be some <laughs> other options that she might prefer and you yeah. might make you not be a couch sleeper. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that you might want to have her pick it out. Well, Let her pick it old, out the gun. That was the old school way we did things. You know, back in the seventies, I had a gun shop, 
And that's uh, what we did. Mm -hmm. And another yeah. thing, that, you know, another thing we did is uh, we call that time frame BC. That was before, right, before Cheryl, Cheryl. when he was a poor, <laughs> sad wretch of a man. Remember, you talk about now he's evolved. You, know, <laughs> you talk about being older and wiser. Well, we did yeah. that. And the other yeah. thing that we did, which was extremely foolish and stupid, and if you if people do this, uh -huh. they need to stop it right now. Yeah, you take a brand new shooter out to oh. the desert to go shooting. And you oh yeah, a big caliber gun. Yeah, I have yeah. learned my lesson so much now. Right. Tell you, to give example, we took like 22 people out shooting one time out in the desert, and we uh -huh. had a, we had a 22 all the way up to a 105 howitzer. That was when we were end. doing it correctly, and, right? And, yeah. And we told the people start with this first gun. If right. you want to go to the second gun, you go to it. If you don't, be fine with the first gun because these were brand right. new. They never shot ever, and. Yeah. Every single person there went all the way, mm -hmm. all the yeah. way. at their Great. own pace. And yeah. and it, yeah. but if we would have started somebody with the forty-five caliber, so right? Uh, you know, or the fifty caliber, uh, whatever Magnum. Yeah. Whatever. So that we could have a good laugh. Right. They would, right. Right. They would have stopped or never shot a gun again, maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. That's yeah. wisdom you learn after you go through the. <laughs> Yeah, I never, I never tell you never tell a lady that she can't shoot. Her. She's like, I want a nineteen eleven forty five. Well, God bless America, go after it. And then when Absolutely. she realizes that maybe it is for her or it's not for her, mm -hmm. then go. Oh, maybe I need something else. Okay, right. great. Let's pick out something else. You know, but um, let you just let people need to decide. And if yes. you, I have it a consultative approach to to the firearms as long as the firearms are of good manufacturing quality. Right. You mm -hmm. know, there's some. Mm -hmm. We're just not going to talk about the bad ones, but uh, there are. There are some mm -hmm. that just don't work. They don't work. And I've seen them break on the range. You know, yeah. these people come to class for the first time, get on the range and parts are falling off the gun right. and they bought it straight from the straight mm. from a, a gun shop, you know? And, mm. so, and I so, there's, so what is what is the most inexpensive, reliable gun? Because there are mm. people that don't have money. OK, and, yeah. and that is a major investment for them. And I have yeah. a gun shop, you know, azfirearms.com. Yep. And we. Mm -hmm we have to struggle with that, that we need guns for people that don't have a lot of money. And so what would you say is the most reliable, inexpensive gun you could buy that's dependable? Okay, so <laughs> there's a caveat to that with all the most inexpensive because uh, it's just, I, I, have a, I have an approach of, you know, cry once, buy once. But uh, if you're talking about inexpensive and, and you're in the industry, so you know, but uh, I'm a big fan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. I'm a big fan of Glock and Sig and you're gonna pay a little more for them but uh, they're gonna last you. Um, mm -hmm. I know that um, the uh, in, more on the inexpensive level, that $400 range, um, Taurus has one or two models. I mm -hmm. think it's the PT709, I think maybe that's it. It's a striker fired um, single stack. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I like the FN models. FNs are not that expensive. The CZ, uh, P10C, those models are good. Um, mm -hmm. And I do know that on revolvers, like the Ruger LCR, the Smith & Wesson 442, 642 snub noses, we were talking about snub noses, that's why I thought about it, but you know, some of those aren't that expensive. The Ruger LCR, I don't think is that pricey. Uh, N38 Special Plus P um, would be a good one to, to have. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in my ways when it comes to quality. I don't compromise. I don't compromise. I know some of them are harder to get, but I would rather um, I, and this is what happened to me as a young guy. I mean, I bought a Taurus lookalike Beretta mm -hmm. and I had metal shavings embedded into my hand and it was just mm. horrible manufacturing for the gun that I bought. And maybe, maybe that was the only one, but it, it turned me off completely because I couldn't get rounds downrange and mm -hmm. uh, the gun wasn't operating well. So I, I got a Glock, I got a Glock mm -hmm. 17 and I had that gun forever, uh, that mm -hmm. Gen 1 from like 1991 um, that, a, that a buddy sold to me. Yeah. On the retail side, that's the hardest decision to make is how we help a uh, person get a gun that doesn't have the money to get a gun and they need a gun yeah. and they need a gun now. Now I don't carry high points or the 25 automatics and all that crap. Right. I don't carry those no. kinds of guns, but you know good you job. Know, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, but it's hard because there are people that you know have tears in their eyes, they need to buy a gun and they can't yeah. finance a gun. And right. I agree with you. To me, I think the lowest level you should get. I mean, the, the best gun for the money is a Glock. Yeah. They work. Yeah. And you can get pre-owned yeah. pre uh, equipment. I, buy a used Glock. Tools. Buy a yeah. used Glock. For right. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway. uh, there's another one out there. Have you had success with Canik? I know Canik yeah, oh. has been doing fairly well, and they're yeah. lower price point. Right? Have you seen that as well? 
you know, we we're selling probably more Canic than any other kind of gun. Oh well, there you go. And I haven't had any come back for repair. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm not from. I've only shot it a little bit, but I know they run really well. So. Very good. Well, we do need to start wrapping up. But this was uh, just a fun, I know, I wish we could keep talking all day. We'll have to go meet each other midway across the valley and uh, sure. have a coffee together or something. Sounds that great. That would be super great. Tell not when it's dark. Not when it's dark. Not when it's dark. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell folks, please, Stephen Powell, how they can follow the work that you do, learn from sure. your videos, and uh, find their own gun life coach in you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, my training company is Patriot Outdoors. You can go to patriotoutdoors.com and stay tuned for classes, courses coming up, uh, this summer. I'll have some courses every month, uh, for patriotoutdoors.com. And, uh, if you want uh, some inspiration and motivation for in life and on the range, go to the gun life coach YouTube channel, subscribe please for the gun life coach. And then all social media outlets, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram for the Patriot Outdoors and for uh, the Gun Life Coach. So that's how okay. you can get a hold of me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us and oh, you're us welcome. look behind you at our beautiful blue sky and green grass yes. here. Free, in Arizona. free Arizona. Yes. Free Arizona. Let's try to we're keep your, it that way with all of our coming. new people moving in from California, yeah, from everywhere else. <laughs> Washington. <laughs> So, yes, right. Right. absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a blessing talking to you guys. Uh, thanks for the show and everything you guys are doing as well. And uh, I will take you up on that cup of coffee. That sounds good. Awesome. Absolutely. And God bless. We will talk soon. Yes, ma'am. We'll see you guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was fun. You know, if you're going to get training, that's the kind of guy, because I never once heard him sound like a drill instructor. Mm -mm. No, no, not like I'm smarter than everybody else. No. And, and there's, there are he takes some life experience from people that he's training. Mm -hmm. He takes those life experiences and works with them too. Mm -hmm. So he's getting training for free. Yeah. And so when people are thinking about, you know, well, I need to find a good trainer or a good coach. I like the way that he refers to himself as a coach um, rather than an instructor. Um, you know, the fit, the fit is important, sure. you know, not every firearms instructor out there is going to kind of speak your language in a lot of ways, right? And you want to be comfortable so that you can build your confidence and not constantly be feeling like, you know, something is off or I always feel like I don't measure up or, you know, something like that. Somebody that challenges you, pushes you, uh, wants you to learn the basics and beyond but um, does it in such a way that they're definitely, you get the, the sense that they're building into your life, not they're just putting another notch on their uh, gun belt. Uh -huh. uh, that, yeah, I have you know, X number of students or X number of followers. Yeah. Or I remember when whatever. you say that, it kind of reminds me when I was in school that there was teachers that I had that you didn't raise your hand because if the question oh, gosh. was stupid, right? And so, I mean, so so yeah. what that caused you to do is to learn less mm -hmm. because you don't question something. Mm -hmm. And so, I I uh, would hope that fire instructors wouldn't do stuff like that because you know these people are coming in brand new, never fired a gun before, and they need help. They need coaching, not 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 hardcore yeah. instructing. Yeah. And so if they don't say what they want to do or do what they think they should do, they're afraid of that, then they're not going to be teachable. Absolutely. So, Boy. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. All right. Well, we need to wrap up and uh, man, that was, I really enjoyed that conversation. Uh, we're definitely going to have to connect with him in real life, not yeah. just here on Zoom. Uh, and also thank you to our amazing listeners all over, not just the state of Arizona, not just you know the United States, but all over the planet. We just value you and love you so much that um, the fact that you could be doing anywhere, uh, be doing anywhere, be doing anything, be anywhere. anywhere, and you took the time to either listen in or watch uh, our shows. Listening in, if you've missed anything, you can go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the 
on demand tab and binge listen to your heart's content wow. all of the episodes we have there and if you click the guest tab you can see pictures and bios and uh, links to all of the works that all of our subject matter experts that we've ever had on uh, have on there and uh, you know it's, it's a great resource and we don't hate it when you spend time there and uh until how about, how about if somebody wanted to contact us how would they do that trail like emails or what absolutely we have talk at gunfreedomradio.com is our email address or any of our social media platforms you can um message us dm messages private messages whatever the the phrases are for each individual uh platform we do read them we do respond. Uh, we love our interactions with our listeners. Uh, we get lots of great ideas from our listeners. Uh, sometimes I can help clarify something that maybe I thought I, I did well on the show, but I left a question hanging in the, the air. Um, so please use those, um, those tools to reach out to us. Even we to pick to, for maybe a new guest. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you know somebody or, yes. Or somebody. Uh, some of our guests have reached out to us and said, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. And I'd love to be a guest on your show. And um, sometimes that's how I'm asked to be a guest on other people's shows. So uh, anyway, communication is the key. Right. All right. Until next time, what are we going to do, Mr. Todd? We're going to pray for our nation. We are. We're also going to pray for our Politicians. leaders. <laughs> We're not praying for leaders. I told you there are no such things. So let wait, me ask wait, you this. Wait, wait, is Stephen a leader? Wait, wait, wait. Stephen there, is a leader wait, wait. in his household. There, there's no on the range. There are no leaders in the politician type thing with this constitution government thing we have here. Okay. You know the thing. You know the, the, thing. the thing. So so I got it, right? We don't pray for we pray for the leaders like Stephen mm -hmm. who are leading the industry to safe. Mm -hmm. uh, responsible shooting, mm -hmm. but our politicians, when you say politicians, they're not leaders. I got that. We don't have a, there's nothing in here that says you have a leader. So I can pray for our leaders, school teachers, um, business owners, and there you go. Instructors. Yeah. But when you ask me to pray for our leaders, I was assuming, just Ooh. assuming you at you assumed? I assumed that you were talking about Did you ask politicians. Him? Because for some reason, there's some politicians, not only the one in New Jersey doesn't believe that the Constitution is a, is a bunch <laughs> Phil of... Phil Murphy. Right? Mm. But there are, there are politicians that believe that uh, they are leaders. Okay? Well, just because they think they're leaders doesn't mean we think they're Remember, leaders. Remember, everybody... Why does the this show always fall quote. apart? Wait, wait. We're trying to wrap up and the show apart. completely. I remember this famous quote from somebody. I, I heard it a couple of weeks ago. Uh. He said, he said, we vote for people who tell us what to do. Mm. Famous quote. Who is that guy? I'm not sure. I think his name was um, the other guy. Yeah, Dan Todd. Dan. So Dan Todd said that. that. We vote for people to tell us what to do. That's scary, isn't it? So anyway, to answer your question, yes, we'll pray for our leaders. We'll pray for our politicians. All, all of, them? of them? Even, what's her name? All of them. Even the ones you don't like? <laughs> Especially the yeah, ones yeah. you don't like? Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Be Have a great day. <laughs> Dan needs a glass of water. Oh, man. Be good to each other. Have a great week. And God bless. Bye.